Joining me now from Paris, former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon. Steve, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I guess the first question Martha, for you. you. Yeah, good to have you here. Um, we have a, just a tiny bit of a delay uh, because he is in Paris. Why do you want to see the end of the EU? And what difference would that make to Americans? It's not the end of the EU at all. In fact, uh, the rise of these populist nationalist parties, they call them the sovereignty movement over here. It's actually to make the EU stronger. It's to make Europe stronger. But it's going to be a collection of nations, individual nation states that are guided by its citizens. And I think you saw this weekend was quite historic. So this is not to make Europe weaker. This is not to make the EU weaker. What it is is to make these nations stronger and have the EU really be a collection of nations instead of one, one United States of Europe. That project was actually ended this week. It was Macron's vision. He called it the Renaissance Project. None of the leading uh, governments in Europe signed up for it. And then you saw the French people rejected on Sunday, and you saw in Italy and, and the UK and other places, Poland and Hungary, overwhelming support uh, for the uh, populist nationalist movement. So this is not, it, it's not to destroy Europe, it's actually to make Europe stronger. That's part of the project fear that the established order is trying to put into people, but it's dead wrong. Well, uh, we've read that uh, Macron, the uh, president of France, has been sort of scrambling to hold on to the center, that what happened in the election on Sunday was an erosion of those center parties and, and a, an increase, obviously, in the seats on the left and on the right. So, you know, but there, if, you put, if you still put some of those in the middle together, and if he can scramble together support, um, how tenuous are the victories that you saw on Sunday, do you think, in the end? I don't think they're tenuous at all. In fact, I think uh, in Brussels tonight, you see uh, Marine Le Pen, you see Salvini, Nigel Farage, others trying to put together what's called a supergroup of these populist nationalist parties, which are kind of distributed in the way they, they do it in the European, European Parliament. They're trying to combine that so they have a critical mass. Remember, the center here, you have both a socialist and then you have kind of a center-left, center-right. Those center-left, center-right parties imploded. The Tory party, the Republic Party of de Gaulle here in France, these things just absolutely imploded over this weekend. And so you're seeing the rise of populism. You're seeing the rise of nationalism. Now these leaders are going to try to put this together so they have a critical mass in the European Parliament, knowing that the people voted against any further integration. They're now going to try to have this powerful blocking minority yeah. to make sure that the bureaucrats in Brussels can't force anything else on them. So what, I mean, what is it? You know, for people who haven't been following this at home, Savini said that there's going to be a new Europe. What does that mean? What, what, what is, what's going to change? It's a Europe of nation states. Is it, remember, go back to 2016. Brexit and the Trump election are inextricably linked. I, I, I think if, if Brexit hadn't happened, you wouldn't have been you wouldn't have empowered the deplorables. You wouldn't have empowered the kind of these working class people to come out and support Donald Trump. That's why Trump that 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 uh, segment you started at the beginning is very prophetic. He could see it right then. It was going to be very important. People want to take their country back. Want to take their borders back. Basically, citizens want to get more control of their countries and more control of the politicians that directly report to them, not faceless bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., or not faceless bureaucrats in Brussels. Yeah. He, I, saw, he saw Brexit for what it was, and, and you know, now you're seeing the next wave of it, right? And Macron in 17 kind of stopped it. We've seen another wave of it with these charismatic leaders like Orban, Salvini, uh, Le Pen, and Farage. Well, you call them charismatic, and some people call them uh, anti-immigrant. They call them anti-Semitic. They say that they see, you know, sort of a throwback to Europe of pre-World War II. Here's Angela Merkel in an interview that she did with CNN talking about her concerns about this movement. We have always had a certain number of anti-Semites amongst us. Unfortunately, there is to this day not a single synagogue, not a single daycare center for Jewish children, not a single school for Jewish children that does not need to be guarded by German policemen. She's saying, you know, the, even the, the nursery schools, every Jewish institution, you know, under this new order, if this comes to, to, comes to pass, will need to be guarded by security. Listen, this is, the, this is the phoniness of Angela Merkel. You know, today she announced she was supposed to leave, but she saw the rise of these populist nationalist parties, and she didn't think the leadership she, she had had in the Christian Democrats was strong enough. She basically said, I'm staying. I'm not going anywhere. Here's the hypocrisy. I was in Berlin uh, two weeks ago. I spent five days there. Actually, I sat down with some of the senior Jewish leaders, and they told me that they live under fear, and it's not from the right. 
I had just been meeting with Alternative for Deutschland, the right-wing party. They said they live under fear because of radical Islam and for this un, uh, unlimited immigration from the Middle East that Angela Merkel let in. And in fact, they said they couldn't even wear their yarmulkes. It just came up the other day. A German authority said the Jewish people in Berlin shouldn't wear their yarmulkes. This shows that Angela Merkel is a total and complete phony, and that's why, that's why this whole globalist movement this weekend took a beating. And for her to sit there and try to smear these parties by saying that when in Germany the Jewish leaders are saying, we fear what she's allowed to happen with this unlimited immigration, particularly from the radical jihadists that are in the country. That's what, that's what they fear in Germany. And people should just go ask the Jewish leaders in Berlin. Uh, here's what Pope Francis had to say. He said, they are often looked down upon, talking about immigrants, and considered the source of all society's ills, that that attitude is an alarm bell warning of the moral decline that we will face if we continue to give ground to the throwaway culture. Your reaction? Yeah, well, look, the Pope is obviously infallible when he's talking about church doctrine, but he, when he's talking about politics, he's just dead wrong. And this is, once again, he, he puts all the onus on the populist nationalist movement. These people are good, decent people. They're not racist. They're not nativist. Uh, they're not xenophobes. But the, the problems, these, these horrific problems in sub-Saharan Africa and in North Africa cannot be solved by working class people in southern Italy. That's what's been the problem, is that the Pope and the rest of these globalists, this kind of party at Davos, want all the problems to be solved by working class people. And that's what Salvini and Orban are speaking for, to say, hey, look, we understand there's a huge problem. We have to work together to solve that problem in sub-Saharan Africa or North Africa or the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Working class people in Hungary and France and in, uh, in Italy can't solve it. And that's where the Pope continues to kind of, I think, exacerbates this problem. But the people voted. S uh, Salvini now and Farage very quickly could be prime ministers of their own countries. Could be, uh, uh, Salvini could be prime minister of Italy. Oh, we'll, we'll by see the wait, fall. which and way Niger it tips. Farage. Yeah, I mean, it could go to, to the yeah, Green Niger Party Farage as well. Niger could be in the UK. Um, you know, obviously there's a big rise well, of the, the Green Party too, so we'll see. Um, I, I, I do want to ask you well, a little bit the about... Green, the Green Party's got a lot of energy. It does, yeah. uh, indeed. And I know you've, you've been talking about that and recognizing that uh, as well. What about your role in all of this? You know, there are all these stories about how, you know, Steve Bannon, you know, got pushed out of the White House and now he's trying to, you know, sell his whole populism overseas. And then Marine Le Pen was quoted as saying that you had nothing to do with her campaign. By the way, this was a European victory by Europeans. The, these leaders over here do not need Americans to come over and tell them how to run campaigns, their strategy, their get out the vote. This was a European victory by the individual parties in those countries, and they should be very proud of that. Look, the reason President Trump and the campaign reached out to me <clears throat> in 2016 is I've been working on this populist nationalist program for about 10 years in the United States. And so I'm a colleague of these people, I'm a friend of these people, but I'm not an advisor. I'm just over here to help spread the message of populism, nationalism, and I'm glad that Merkel and Macron and their heads blow up uh, when I come over here to, uh, to have my presence and kind of root on, have a rooting interest in, the, uh, in, the, in these great political movements that are really taking charge of Europe now. So you said when you left the White House that the whole America first, the drain the swamp part of, of everything in the Trump campaign or the Trump presidency was over. You said that presidency is over. Do you still believe that? Well, I think it turned around. I think you saw all the globalists at that time. You had a you had a huge emphasis. Remember, that's when we didn't get a chance to build the wall. That's when we hadn't gotten our trade. We hadn't taken on China. If you look in the summer of 17, it was kind of the doldrums. And by the way, you should read, I think, the book by Woodward. I actually tendered my resignation to General Kelly on August 7th and then left uh, 10 days later. Um, but that was the doldrums. President Trump is now full on. He's building the wall. He's down there fighting the courts. He's, uh, he's doing a f fantastic job in engaging on this economic war that China's been running uh, on the United States. He's, he's engaging the radical, you know, com Communist Party in China, you know, President Xi and Wang Shishan, these radicals that are taking control of China. You saw in this great effort he had in Japan over the last couple of days, which the mainstream media is focused on his Twitter feed. People in Asia are focused on how he has bound together the Japanese and the American military and the Navy and sent a very strong signal 
to the to countries around the South China Sea that the Americans and the Japanese are going to work together to make sure those sea lanes are free. It was a very powerful couple of days for the president. So I think the president's on fire right now with this program. Back, he's completing the promises he made to the American people. That's why the economy's doing well, and I think that's why he's seeing an America yeah. first national security policy that people understand. Uh, you know, but he's got to win the next election. He wants to be president for another four years. Um, take a look at this Monmouth poll. Most Americans, 62 percent, feel that U.S. consumers will bear the brunt of paying for new tariffs on Chinese goods. That could that could hurt him. Uh, and, you know, some of the national polls, obviously it's early, and their national polls show him losing to Joe Biden and others. Mar 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 Martha, Martha, this is another project fear on these tariffs. Okay, first off, the 3.2% economic growth, a big part of that came because he's shrinking the deficit with China. He's moving the supply chain back. That's why one of the reasons unemployment's so low. Also, import prices are dropping. There's a number of articles out today about how this, war, this economic war that we're engaged with now may actually be deflationary. So this is the fear project of Wall Street. Remember, three weeks, four weeks ago, they said the stock market's going to implode and it's going to take the economy down. It's a stone cold lie. The cheering section of well, Wall Street down for the last that basically ship these jobs, they, 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 they slip these, they ship these, yeah, but it's on the margins. They, they ship these jobs to Asia and President Trump's bringing them back. And everything the fear project said is absolutely wrong. And so you're seeing, you're going to see the supply chain come back and with that high value added manufacturing jobs. I got two quick questions for you that I'm going to try to squeeze in here. Um, you're part of a group that built a mile of wall on private property in El Paso. Is that a trend that we're going to see continue? Well, we've raised money to try to do those places that the president's got, you know, a billion and a half dollars held up in the courts. The, the federal government's got where they're going to build it. There's certain aspects that they're not going to build. Uh, Brian Colfage and Chris Kobach and others have raised this money, and we're going to go around. We're already cutting deals all up and down the border to, on private property where the government's not going to build. We're going to be there and try to build the wall. We're outside of El Paso, Texas right now, uh, building the first batch of it. I think we're 85 percent completed on the first uh, three quarters of a mile. Because it connected, I think, 21 miles on either side um, and, and cut off an area that people were coming through. It's a very interesting project. Um, last question. You still wish you were at the White House, and do you still talk to the president? No, I, I, I was very glad. I did my one year for the campaign of that. I, I'm very happy outside. You know, they're doing a terrific job. And, and no, and, until the Mueller investigation's over, uh, you know, I, no need over. to uh, to talk to the president. It looks like, it, it looks, no, well, it, 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 talk to Jerry Nadler. I'm on the list to be subpoenaed uh, to go up there, right? They, they've already got uh, Don McGahn, Hope Hicks, and Annie McDowell, and Reince Priebus and I are the other two that have been named. And so when this thing's all over, uh, I'll feel very comfortable in doing it. But while the Democrats are trying to weaponize the Mueller report, uh, it's no need for me to. Steve Bannon, thank you very much. Good to speak with you tonight. Thanks, Martha. You bet.